Okay, so we finished hate speech. Uh, so what comes after hate speech? Build a wall. Okay, now guys, on the southern border. So before you answer this, and you may let, let me just give you paint a whole picture for you. Can I do that? Okay. Uh, okay. So first of all, I want to say this: uh, every person in here, their family came from somewhere else. Nobody in this room is 100% Native American. Am I correct in saying that? Somebody prove me wrong. Okay. So we all came from somewhere else, right? Yes. Okay. You hear this thing, we're a nation of immigrants. That's true, uh, except for our 100% Native American people who probably immigrated here, their families, a very, 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 very long time ago. Okay. I, the Ebright clan, came in the 1740s, okay? Some of you guys are first generation. So it doesn't really matter because we talked about the 14th Amendment, which says equal protection under the law for all citizens. It doesn't matter how long your family's been, okay? So that being said, let's talk about immigration, period. We need it. Guys, the United States of America is not producing enough children to keep pace with population. Okay, so the average couple, okay, married couple, is having on average 1.7 children per couple. That's an average. I, I know. How do you have a 0.7? You, you guys understand. Okay. So in Japan, guys, it's like 1.3. And they don't do immigration. So their population is shrinking. You, you follow. So we need immigration to fill, I mean, the, the jobs, to pay the taxes for the things that we do in this country. We need people. Then you have what's called legal immigration and an illegal immigration, right? So legal immigration is costly. Time can, it takes a long time to do it, okay? And... Um, is a smaller number. Illegal immigration is a much larger number, okay? We talk about how many people are in the country illegally. There's two types of people in the country illegally. Those that cross the border illegally and those that come here on visas and never leave. So I talked to Team this morning. He is on an education visa from Vietnam. He is allowed to stay in the United States through his college education if he chooses. He may just stay for high school and then go back. Or he may go to Wichita State and stay on, finish his degree, and then he's supposed to leave. What if he doesn't? 40% of the people that are in the country illegally are here on visa overstay, not from across our border. So 60% would be coming across the border. Wait with me. Okay. Now, that being said, the number of illegal immigrants in this country today is somewhere around 20 million. When Joe Biden took office, they estimated between 12, 14 million. Now it's 20 million. <laughs> Over 20 million. Okay. So, this proposes some good things and some bad things. First of all, why do people want to come to the United States? Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, <clears throat> bad living conditions uh, under a oppressive government. Okay, so let's talk about our Vietnamese students. Okay, so if you, kn you know some of our Vietnamese students, okay, almost all of their families got here on what was called political asylum. They were fleeing an oppressive communist government. And the United States granted these folks 
political asylum. Because if they went back to their country, they were likely to be punished or killed by their government. We did the same thing with Cubans that were fleeing communism. Yes? Okay. Now, are there corrupt governments all over the world? Is that a reason? Do we have to accept people from every corrupt government in the world? No. So this thing called asylum is for political purposes, um, generally. Now, if you are on the most wanted list of the cartel or the Colombian drug lords, and you show up at our border and say, if I go back, they're going to kill my family and me, you might have a good claim to asylum. Okay? That's going to go in front of a judge, and a judge is going to determine whether you get to come into the country or not. Following me. So, during the Trump years, if you came to our border and seek asylum, you had to remain in Mexico until a judge heard your case. Now guys, under international law, there is no such thing as economic asylum. The economy in my country sucks, so I can claim economic asylum at the American border and they will let me in and I can stay forever. <laughs> that doesn't exist. In fact, under international law, guys, if you are fleeing Guatemala for political asylum, you're supposed to flee to the con a country that borders your country. So in Guatemala, you could, you could seek asylum in Belize, El Salvador, Mexico, or Honduras, but not the United States. Same thing with Honduras. You can seek asylum in one of those bordering countries. You're not allowed to skip a bunch of countries and come to our border and seek economic asylum, which doesn't even exist. So the Biden administration changed the rule. They said, if you made it to our border, you seek out a border patrol agent, claim asylum, they will process you, take your name, give you a court date to go for, in front of a judge so that they will hear that case, and then they release you into the United States. Now, if you show up at the border today, which thousands will today, the Border Patrol agents are going to process your name. They're going to give you a court date between eight and nine years from now. That's when your court date is. Guys, there have been eight million people come across the border since Biden has been president in three years. Eight million. The entire population of Kansas, guys, is three million. It's called catch and release. So guys, people coming to the border are not trying to sneak into the country. Most of them are seeking out our border agents. So our border agents have turned into processing agents. Just you come, find us, okay? There's 200 migrants for every border agent. So all day long, this is what our border agents are doing, is filling out paperwork. And they're probably going to give most of these people a cell phone. Now, are most of the people doing this bringing women and children with them? Go look at the border. Most of the people coming up to the border are your age or a little bit older, and most of them are men of what you would call military fighting age. Men of military fighting age. And guys, most of these people are not coming from Mexico. You understand? Chinese people, where they used to have about a thousand a year of Chinese people trying to sneak into the country. That number's gone way up. Chinese are paying the cartels $50,000 to get them to the border. Now, if you're from China, and you have $50,000 to spend to get into the United States. 
why are you leaving China? Because if you have that kind of money, you're not hurting in China. You're doing, actually, you're elite. So who's coming up? Is it the Chinese government giving these people money of military fighting age, men, money to come into our country? People are coming from every corner of the world, and the cartels are getting fat, rich on this. It's called human trafficking. And we're catch and release. Come on in. Come on in. Come out. Now, there are those people that try to sneak into the country. But while the Border Patrol agents are filling out paperwork, who's watching the border? Like I said, 200 migrants to every Border Patrol agent. Now, Monday, guys, in Iowa, they had the Iowa caucus. And you guys hear about this on the news? The Iowa caucus? I mean, it was everywhere. Yeah, it was the Republican caucus. So you had Trump, Haley, Nikki Haley, DeSantis, Ramaswamy. And a guy named Asia Hutchinson. Uh, these were the Republicans that were on the ballot in Iowa. Okay? That was Monday. Next Tuesday, New Hampshire goes. And they're selecting which one of these candidates is going to be the nominee for the Republican Party. Joe Biden is the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party, assuming he runs. He said he's going to run. There is a challenger, but the Democrat Party is not having these these caucuses or elections. They're basically saying, Biden, this is yours. Okay, so Trump. Hutchinson dropped out. <coughs> Ramaswamy dropped out. Yesterday, the day after the Iowa caucus, Ramaswamy was at a speech with Trump yesterday. He is now throwing his support behind Trump. Okay. You guys know Ramaswamy by that Ram I've talked about him. Okay. So, Haley and DeSantis, how long will they be in this? After New Hampshire, we'll see. Now, in New Hampshire, you have independent voters. If you're registered as an independent, you can vote in this, this election, okay? In Kansas, if you want to choose between these three candidates, you've got to be a registered Republican. You can only vote if you're a member of that party. Does that make sense? Kansas's primary election is on March 4th. How many of you guys will be 18 before March 4th? Okay. Guys, you can register now, but by March 4th, that's probably going to happen. <laughs> Actually, DeSantis finished second. Haley had 19%. Haley finished third. But she's expected to do well in New Hampshire because of all those independents that get to vote in that. They may not like Trump as much. Does that make sense? So she's expected to do well, and then it goes to South Carolina, where Nikki Haley used to be the governor of South Carolina for eight years. Trump is way ahead of her in the polls in her home state. So after South Carolina, guys, that's what you got to have. That's what's likely to happen. And then Trump, obviously, guys, he's got some legal problems. He's got four different cases that he's fighting in court right now, okay? One or two of which could land him in jail. Can you run for president for president from jail? Yeah. Can you get elected from jail? Yeah. Can you pardon yourself? I don't know. You could try. Okay, so this is really going to be an interesting year, guys. Okay, now I'll take you up to, you know, the end of May. 
okay? And then you'll be on your own, okay? But this could be interesting, okay? So the Republican Party right now is trying to figure out who their nominee is going to be. If Biden decides not to run, it's all hands on deck. You'll see a bunch of Democrats throw their name in, and the Democratic Party is going to figure out who their nominee is going to be, okay? Now, if that happens by March, if you are if you lean Democrat, when we're done with this thing, you want to register as a Democrat. If you register as an independent, guys, in the state of Kansas, you do not get to vote in either one of these primaries, the Democrat or the Republican. But when we're done with this process, you look at it and say, okay, I'm going to register as a Republican or a Democrat. And it, hey, you can register as an independent. I, I don't care. Okay. Fact is, guys, you can't vote. Let's register. Now, if all you guys have raised your hands, any of you guys already registered to vote? Okay, good. All right, so even if you're not 18 yet, you can register now, okay? By March 4th, you can vote if you're there 18 by then, okay? They'll send it to you when you turn 18. You can register now. Just go to the Google. Type in register to vote Kansas. It'll take you to the Secretary of State's office. They'll fill out a form. They'll send you a form, have you sign it, and you send it back in, you're registered to vote. Done. Okay. Or you can go to Dillon's. You can go to the post office. Okay. You can go to City Hall to register. Okay. All right. So back to what were we talking about? Immigration. Okay. So, guys. The biggest issue that people said when they showed up at the poll, they do these things called exit polls. So after people go in and vote, pollsters will ask them, what's the most important issue for you in this election? The top two issues were the economy, obviously inflation, right? Number two, in Iowa, for the voters of Iowa, Republican voters of Iowa, was immigration. It's going to be a big issue in this up upcoming election, Okay. The governor of Texas, guys, has called out the National Guard and told the border agents to move. We're not letting anybody in here. So the federal government is suing the, the state of Texas, saying you got to move those people. Well, the federal government's job is to control immigration, not the states. It's not a role of the states. It's the federal government. But if the federal government is not doing their job, in Texas, guys, think about how many of these migrants are coming to Texas. So the governor of Texas has been putting these folks on buses and sending them to sanctuary cities. You guys know what sanctuary cities are? Here's a sanctuary city. You commit a crime in New York City. You're here in the country illegally. You assault somebody. You rape somebody. Yeah, you might go to jail, but they're not going to call ICE or Immigration Customs Enforcement so that you can be deported. They're not going to call ICE, even though they know you're in the country illegally committing crime. The whole state of California is a sanctuary state. So the governor of Texas is just, hey, all right, you want, you want migrants? Here you go. Put them on buses. Now, the government is paying what are called NGOs, non-government organizations, to house these people to feed them and then put them on planes and buses to send them across the country. States don't have a choice. These migrants show up in Wichita, you take them. Okay? You take them. Now, Chicago and New York are overwhelmed. Guys, those cities are taking entire hotels. The government is booking them because they have nowhere to house these people. There's not enough and these folks, guys, through none of their own fault, they can't work in this country. They don't have green cards. So they can't house themselves. They can't feed themselves. Who's paying for that? We are. $450 million is going to cost the taxpayers of this country this year to feed and house 8 million people that came into this country over the last three years. Okay. And when these asylum hearings, when they when they get their date, their court date, what percentage of them are showing up for their court date? Very few. Because they know there is no such thing as economic asylum. 
A political asylum, I'm showing up for my court date. I'm from Ukraine. There's a war going on. I fear for my life, my family's life, for years. Will you grant us political asylum? Judge is likely to say yes. But the economy sucks in Mexico. The government's corrupt. The government sucks in Honduras. The government's corrupt. The economy sucks. I want a better life. I want economic asylum. Doesn't exist. Judge is going to ask you to leave. So are you going to show up for your hearing? No. You're going to just be like, just like those visa overstays. You're going to melt into the country. Probably try and get some type of fake social security number so you can work. Okay. So let's talk about the positives of illegal immigration. When people do get into the country, some businesses will hire people that are not here, le- uh, here legally. Okay, If you're paying somebody that's in the country illegally, you want to do it off the books. So you pay them cash. All right? Now, you pay them cash. Now, what kind of jobs are these, these migrants getting? You ever been to Garden City? Heard of Garden City? Dodge City? It's a big industry out there. The meatpacking industry. Okay? Meatpacking. Do you guys want to work in a meatpacking facility? I don't want to work in a meatpacking facility. In fact, a lot of Americans don't want to work in a meatpacking facility, so they rely on migrant labor. Yes? And they pay them less. Which means the cost of your meat, my Johnsonville sausage, is cheaper. Ever seen anybody put a roof on a house in Wichita, Kansas? Where are the workers live? Where are they from? Concrete? Construction? Okay? Now, if you can pay folks less, that means roofing construction costs are less. Yes? Some people might think that's good. Okay? And what those migrants are making is way more than what they were making in Mexico or El Salvador or Honduras or Colombia. Good for them? Good for us? Good? Now, the fact is, a lot of white suburban kids in this country don't want to do construction. They don't want to work hard. They want to sit on their couch and play video games. Where you got people that are hungry. People that are hungry, and I mean that in more than one way. You know what I mean? Like, they're hungry for a better life, and they're hungry. Literally. They're willing to do whatever it takes, and whatever job it takes. And I, you know what I say to that? I say, God bless them. They're, they're going to hustle. You know what I mean? And so if you own a construction company and you're hiring workers, you want people that are going to hustle, or you want people that are late for work and going to bitch about having to sweat and get dirty and all that. I know people in the construction construction industry. I'm like, I ain't hiring white people. I'm hiring Mexicans. Okay. And they pay them well. Okay? Hopefully. Now, the expense comes here. When children of migrants show up at schools, you don't turn them away. They don't speak English. You gotta hire more teachers. You gotta hire more ESL teachers. You need a you need a lot. That's expensive. If people are in the country illegally, chances are they don't have health insurance. You show up at the emergency room, guys, they're not going to turn you away. So if that medical bill is not paid, who's gonna, who is the hospital going to pass that cost on to? 
people that have insurance. So insurance premiums for the rest of us go up because hospitals have to recoup that money they're not getting paid. Follow me. So there's a benefit and a cost to migration. Okay. So I'm trying to be fair here. Am I being fair? Am I being fair? So if you build a wall, first of all, under Biden, guys, if things don't change, it's a magnet. So if they know they can come to the border and get released, no matter what, they're going to keep coming by the millions from all over the world. So you're going to have a chance to vote in the next election. Now, Kansas only has six electoral college votes. Kansas will vote for the Republican. 99% chance. Okay. This is a big issue. Now, if you build a wall, there are people sneaking in here, right? Does where there is a fence or a wall of some sort, does illegal migration slow down in those areas? The answer is yes. Definitively yes. Can you build a tunnel under the wall? Do the cartels do that? Yes, they do. Okay, can you use that ground imaging radar sonar to find those tunnels? Yes. Can people scale the walls? Yes. Okay, there are ways around, over, or under the wall. Okay, but it is a deterrent. It does slow it down. It does help us control the border. Now, I told you it's going to cost $450 billion dollars to house and feed the people from the last three years. Can you finish the wall, the fence, $450 billion? Like four times that. Finish the wall. Four times over with four hundred and fifty billion. Guys, we're talking about twenty billion dollars to finish the wall that's not broken. But don't tell me it's you know crazy amount to build, finish this wall. It's not. In fact, if you go back to the Bush years, they appropriated the money for it. They just didn't do it. You know who likes cheap labor? Businesses like cheap labor. So the what's called the Chamber of Commerce, which is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, businesses are all members, these members of this Congress, they like illegal migration because it's cheap labor. Now, if you're an African American living in the United States, you are among the most highly unemployed people in the United States. If migrants take jobs, unskilled labor that blacks that might be unskilled do, or whites that might be unskilled do, what happens to wages when you allow so many people to come in to take unskilled labor jobs? Wages are depressed for everyone. Follow me. It affects everybody when it comes to wages. Okay, because if you won't do this job for this much, I can find somebody that will do this job. That's what businesses love, okay? So there's, there's two sides of this. The Republican Party and the Democratic Party use this issue as a wedge issue to criticize the other side. Republicans <coughs> want to build a wall. They don't like brown people. Democrats want to have an open border and let anybody into this country and it's a national security threat. And it's costing us all kinds of money and it's taking other people's jobs. Americans' jobs. Depressing wages. So both sides love this issue. That's why they don't fix it. We've been talking about illegal immigration for 50 years in this country. Okay? Now, did Trump bring it under control with his stay in Mexico policy? Could Biden bring it under control today 
by saying from here on out. So that person that's planning to leave China, that person that's leaving Bangladesh or Nigeria or Mali in Africa, they say, oh, it's remain in Mexico. I'm not going. He would cut it in half almost immediately. Is Biden going to do the remain in Mexico? I don't know. We'll see. He's got 10 months for the election. Bring this under control. Will border help? Are, border, are, walls, are walls bad? Mr. Ebright, the Berlin Wall was a terrible thing. We shouldn't have walls. Well, wait a second. The Berlin Wall was built to keep people in. Not keep a lot, keep people out. You got a fence around your yard? Does the White House have a fence around the White House? Why? To keep people out. Does Obama have a fence around his house? Yeah, to keep people out that aren't supposed to be there. So some people think we should, hey, we should just have open borders. Let anybody that wants to come to America come in. Some people think we have a right to control our boards, which we do, and that we should. Will the wall help? Yeah. You decide. I gave you a big, broad thing on that, right? Okay, and I hope I was fair. I tried to be fair on that, okay? What's next? Death penalty? Death penalty? Okay. Listen, guys, let me talk about this. The Eighth Amendment to the Constitution in the Bill of Rights says, there shall be no cruel and unusual punishment. That was written in 1791. We were still publicly hanging people. So the death penalty is not cruel and unusual. The punishment has to fit the crime. Again, this is not, we don't live in a religious society. We have a secular law. You guys know what the church says on this. Yes? Now, in 1976, the Supreme Court said it's cruel and unusual. For four years, guys, there was no death penalty in the United States. By the way, those were the years that BTK committed all of his murders when there was no death penalty. So when we caught the guy, we couldn't charge him with the death penalty because there was no law, okay? In 1980, the Supreme Court reversed itself and said, we're gonna leave it up to the states, just like abortion, it's left up to the state. Why it should be, okay? So, some states have it, some states don't. Some states use it, some states have it and don't use it, Kansas. We have the death penalty, we haven't used it since 1980, when it was reinstated. Are there people on death row in Kansas? Yes. Okay. And I don't see the Carr brothers being executed under the tenure of Governor Laura Kelly. Now, if you get a different governor in there, you might see the first execution in Kansas since 1980 with the Carr brothers or others that are on death row. Okay. Listen, this comes down to couple major arguments besides the religious argument. Church teaches guys that it used to say if you couldn't house them safely to keep them away from society, like in a maximum security prison, then if you can't do that, then you can use the death penalty. Today they have basically said, well, since you can do that, there's no, there shouldn't be any death penalty. You guys have heard that? Okay. Now, Economic debate on this, which costs more? To try somebody for the death penalty and carry it out or put them in life in prison without parole, which costs more? So you take a 20 year old, okay? They live till they're 80, that's 60 years you gotta feed, house, and have guards to protect them. 60 years. Now, the cost of a death penalty so guys, if you're on trial for armed robbery and you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. Yes? The state is going to pay for that lawyer. The taxpayer. 
Okay. If you are tried in a death penalty case and you can't afford an attorney, they're going to give you a high priced attorney because on appeal, you'd be like, I didn't have adequate representation. So they're going to pay for a very experienced death penalty attorney for you, which is expensive for the state. You follow me? Then if you are convicted, the appeals process for death penalty cases is very long. It takes decades usually to put somebody to death after they appeal, 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 appeal. Okay. Both are very expensive. Guys, death row inmates are in their own facility. So you may have 15 death row inmates and two guards for those inmates. That's a 15 or a seven or eight to one ratio, where in the general population, you may have 50 inmates to one prison guard. So it's more expensive to house these people in the death row. Follow me. So that's your economic argument. Some people that aren't Catholic would say, okay, let's go Old Testament. Eye for an eye. <coughs> and then some would say, let's go New Testament. Turn the cheek. Forgiveness. Okay. The last argument is deterrence. So, guys, Arkansas, Alabama, Texas, they use the death penalty. Now, you only get the death penalty for first degree murder. That means you plan it and carry it out. So if you're planning on killing somebody in the state of Texas, you know that if you're caught, there's a good chance you're going to get the death penalty and be killed. Is it a deterrent? Does it stop people from doing it? I can't answer that question. Okay. So I don't know. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with the Carr brothers? Somebody in your family known the victims? Got friends, family? Because this is one of the worst murders uh, in Kansas history, uh, Wichita history. Happened about 20 years ago. Want to hear it? Not good. Want to hear it? Jonathan and Reginald Carr from, uh, I think they were, they were from Western Kansas, uh, two African American fellows. They were in Wichita. It's December, I believe. It was winter. There's snow on the ground. They broke into an apartment. There were either four or five college students in there. They were Catholic. Um, at gunpoint, Carr brothers forced them to go to the ATMs and withdraw money from their bank. Took them back to the apartment. Brent, you remember where there were four or five victims, Carr brothers? One survived. Okay, yeah, there were five students. And, um, yeah. Um, well, you heard his opinion. Um, so then they raped the girls in the apartment while the, the men, the, the male students watch. And then they forced, and the, these were virgins. They were all virgins. Um, then they forced the male college students to have sex with the females at gunpoint. So you can imagine the trauma here. When they were done with that, after hours of this, they took them all naked to Greenwich and K96. Now, you guys know where Cabela's is? K96, uh, that, there were, used to not be a ramp there, so it was just an overpass over Greenwich Road, okay? And so there was nothing out there. There were some houses off, but nothing on Greenwich Road. They had them get out of the car and kneel on the side of the road. And they shot all five of them in the back of the head. 
in the snow. One of the girls had a hair clip. Bullet ricochet. Now she was bleeding as the others. So they all fell face first. And they drove off. She survived. We have an eyewitness. She got up and walked. She saw lights. There's a pond there. That pond is still there. She walked around that pond in the snow and started knocking on doors. Maybe. By 9 a.m. the next morning, they caught these two guys at an apartment complex over by Wichita State. A buddy of mine who used to be my assistant coach here, Mike Lentz, uh, was, a, is a, was a parole officer. He was in the jail that morning. These guys, the Carr brothers were laughing about it. They have shown no remorse. They were convicted, sentenced to death. Okay? About eight years ago, they have appealed. So they appealed the death penalty conviction, saying that the brother should have been sentenced separately because Jonathan was the ringleader. Reginald was just kind of following a law that they should have been sentenced separately. The Kansas Supreme Court agreed and overturned the death penalty conviction of these two men. The Attorney General of the state of Kansas sued to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court. There's nine justices. Justice Anton Scalia, who had been a judge for 50 plus years, said this is maybe the worst case, most violent murder case that I have ever witnessed as a judge. The U.S. Supreme Court voted 9-0 to overturn the Kansas Supreme Court and reinstate the death penalty for these two men. Okay? They have shown no remorse to this day. They're still in prison in El Dorado on death row, almost 20 years later. Now, no must Coach Holman's opinion. You can go to church on this, stand with the church on this, like, you know, other, other arguments you talk about victims' families. A lot of times, victims' families will want to forgive this perpetrator. Some of them want them gone from the face of the earth. Now, are they in a maximum security prison? Yes. The chances of breaking all out are almost zero. Okay? And doing harm to other people. I'm going to leave it in your hands. Okay? You decide. All right. Is that fair? Trying to be fair. Okay. All right. Got a couple minutes left. Privatized social security. We're on uh, extended today. Okay. Privatized social security is the next one. Okay. Now, not everybody had me last semester. But those of you that did will remember some of this. Okay. Let me start. Okay. Any of you guys that have a job, you're paying social security taxes. That is 6.2% of your income. Social Security was created in 1935. The retirement age was set at 65. So when you turned 65, you would get a, re a check from the government. You paid in that money, they hold on to it for you, and then when you get old, they give it back to you in installments. Everybody following that? Life expectancy in 1935 was 66. So the average American will be on Social Security for one year. Today, they've raised the Social Security retirement age to 67. Life expectancy is 79. You add to that the baby boom from 1946 to 1965. Right now, baby boom generation, those people are retiring in large numbers. And there's a lot of them. And they're living longer. So the average recipient of Social Security grandma is $1,300 a month. That's the average. Some people get a lot more than that. Some people get less than that. Okay. My wife's Social Security check is going to be bigger than my Social Security check. Why? Because her 6.2% is more than my 6.2%. Does that make sense? 
Now, there are three parts of Social Security. That's this part, okay? The second part, the retirement part, then the public assistance or disability. This is paid for from other taxes, not this 6.2%. The third part is unemployment insurance, which comes from what's called the payroll tax. So your boss, my boss, which is the diocese, has to pay 6.2% every month. They have to match what I pay. Okay, so Mr. Willis, who makes less money than I do, the diocese pays less for him than it does for me. You follow? So employers that pay somebody $100,000 a year pay more, you know what I mean? This is the payroll tax for employers. That funds this. You lose your job, you get laid off, you get a check from the government for 26 weeks or six months until you can find another job. That's funded through Social Security taxes. Everybody understand? Newbies? Does that make sense? Okay. Under the current funding model, 2037, Social Security will be bankrupt. That is 13 years from now if my math is right. So what are you gonna do to continue to fund Social Security? It's a very popular program in this country. People like Social Security because if you retire and you have nothing saved, you have some income. Now, if you become a housewife, say you work for 10 years, become a housewife, and you never go back to work again, your Social Security check's not gonna be very big. If your husband dies, you can take his instead of yours. Does that make sense? Now, so what are you going to have to do to continue to fund Social Security? Well, you're going to have to raise taxes, or you can cut this benefit that people get, the old people get. We're not going to do that. Why? Because old people vote. The members of Congress are going to be the ones making the decision, and they want to get reelected. Old people vote. You're not going to cut this. So you're either going to raise taxes or here's another thing. This is called means testing. All right. Now, let's say you make $150,000 a year. Okay. You only pay Social Security taxes up to... 119,000. That last 31,000, you don't pay any Social Security tax. So if you make a million dollars a year, you only pay Social Security on the first 119,000. This is called means test. Because, guys, somebody that makes 150,000 or $200,000 a year, guys, they're never going to get that money out of Social Security. Social Security is not welfare. You don't pay in, you don't get it. It's not welfare. So they said, listen, we already taxed the rich. They, they pay taxes on their income, and they pay 6.2% of what they're making. They're never going to get that money back out. It, it would just become another welfare program if you went up to 150000 or 200000 or two hundred fifty. It's just another welfare program. You're just redistributing income because you'll never get that money out. And guys, you can't opt out of Social Security. Like, listen, I don't want anything from the government when I turn 65. I, I don't want it, so I'm not going to pay in. I'm not paying any 6.2. I'm opting out right now. You can't do that. You have to pay Social Security. Follow me. You're stuck. So, guys, 50, we get out. So listen. Tomorrow, I'm going to share with you a way to fix this system to where when you retire, this 1300 could be a heck of a lot more. Okay? And we can solve this problem through what's called privatization. Okay? So look forward to that tomorrow.
Hope uh, you guys that are on the bus watch this and are having fun and nobody gets sick. Be safe.